plastic is everywhere. It has infiltrated almost all aspects of our daily life. But this highly durable, convenient, and cheap material might cost us our health, the health of our oceans and marine life. Growing up in Singapore's coastal town of Pasir Ris, Matilda De Silva has always been a fan of the water. Uh, welcome to my home. This is Pasir Ris Beach. This is a very unique beach because there's so much of activity happening here. We have our volunteers to come out. She used to represent Singapore in dragon boat racing, but exposure to water polluted with sewage during a race in the Philippines in 2015 left her with an autoimmune disease. I developed muscular spasms, so sometimes I have difficulties like walking or talking or, or moving. I couldn't dragon boat anymore. Definitely wasn't going to be a national team. Definitely couldn't coach dragon boat anymore. Even standing on stage, because I'm a singer and I'm a performer, it just kind of looked like really weird when I like started going into a spasm. I lost my voice for about six months and it was like, this is not fair at all. But after you think about it, you're like, okay, you just got exposed for three days. What about people who live there? Her personal journey led her to start Ocean Purpose Project, a social enterprise dedicated to cleaning and protecting our oceans. To understand more about her work, we decided to join her for a beach cleanup at her hometown of Pasir Ris. Even on the ground, human activities at sea are starting to impact us. These nylon fish nets, right, made of plastic, they're so light, they can be picked up off the sea and like, you know, and carried over here via the wind. Every piece of plastic that you pick up prevents it from being broken down into smaller pieces, ending up in our water systems, and eventually ending up in all of these floating farms that you see. There are about 60 of them in the Pasir Ris waters, and they supply Singapore with a lot of our seafood. So imagine the fish that you eat are consuming stuff like this. What we are going to be doing is to be accessing an area that is not usually cleaned because they can't go into those mangrove areas. <laughs> Miru, come, let's go inside the mangrove. <laughs> Plastic here. Now, I've only been inside of this mangrove for what, less than 10 minutes. Here's what I've got. But I'm sorry, I'm using a plastic bag to collect plastic waste. So we have single-use plate, single-use cup for your beach barbecue parties. And a lot of those plastic bags we're actually stuffed with uh, seaweed. It was really hard in the sand, so you have to pull it out. You also have a rice bag that may not even from Singapore. Some of this plastic trash actually flew from the neighboring countries. But collecting marine litter is just one part of the solution. Matilda is working with scientists to find out if this junk can be put to good use. I have a bag of household garbage with me today, but what if we can turn these into something of economic value? A group of scientists here at Nanyang Technological University of Singapore are working on a solution to turn this trash into treasure. And we're meeting Andre today. He's one of the team members. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Can you show us how it works? Yes, let's go. 
let's go to our shredding room to crush it. Okay. So that we can use it in our pyrolysis system. So can we put any kind of plastics in this machine? Yes, we can use household plastic waste. We can use marine plastic litter without sorting. So for example, I have a bag of household plastic here, chip, packaging, yes. single use, right? Water yes. bottle. It's all good. Um, this, these two are different type of plastic. It's okay. It, we can just we put can, it inside. We uh, can use mixtures, yes. Okay, and like things like shampoo bottle. Shampoo bottles, perfect. Which is a little bit harder. That it's will okay. work too. Yes. Okay. So this is going to be the very first step: collect all kinds of plastic and feed it into the machine. That's right. So, the plastic becomes shredded like this. Yes, this is our plastic for today. It almost looks like plastic confetti. This is the equipment we're going to use today. Okay. This is the cold room. Yes, this is a cold room where we store plastics. This is from last beach cleanup, collected in Pasir Ris. Okay. Dirty type of plastics, it has PT bottles, everything there. Andre will now take us through the process of converting the shredded plastic liter into products like oil, hydrogen gas, and carbon nanotubes. What we're gonna do now, yeah. we're gonna use this plastic first to decompose it into volatile products. Yeah. We're gonna take this sample and feed it into our reactor system where it will undergo decomposition. It's already preheated to around 450 degrees, okay. which is uh, the temperature at which we're gonna decompose this plastic. We feed approximately 10, 15 grams every 10 minutes. So now plastic dropped inside this pyrolyzer, it will start decomposing and gases from this reactor will be transferred into a condenser and we're gonna collect oil. And this oil can be used for what kind of usage? Uh, this oil is a substitute of crude oil. So basically, it can be used as a feedstock to manufacture new plastics or it can be used as a fuel. So you can resell it back to the industries? If quality of oil is meeting requirements of uh, customers, it can be resold to them. If, say, it does not uh, meet requirements of customers, it can be used on site as a fuel because it's basically a mixture of diesel gasoline fractions. They can be used to fuel the process so we don't have to buy diesel from a fossil feedstock, for example. Right. The idea is to use as little as possible fossil resources when we do manufacturing and also recover as much as possible from uh, plastic waste. And then the remaining gases we will use feeding into another setup. In the second stage, the gas goes into a reactor filled with a catalyst, developed by the team here, which enables the production of hydrogen and carbon nanotubes. This is a sample of gas collected after the process. It should contain mainly hydrogen and methane. From this system, we produce around one liter per minute of uh, hydrogen gas. And right now, what's the real life application? Oh, hydrogen is a common feedstock in uh, manufacturing of chemicals. It's also used for power generation in the small quantities. Hydrogen is considered a key resource for decarbonized economy because it can be used as a fuel that does not give CO2 emissions. It's clean fuel to power vehicles. We expect that market of hydrogen will grow and uh, consumption of hydrogen also will grow once we will start switching from using fossil fuels like natural gas and petroleum to a cleaner version. Mm -hmm. This is carbon nanotubes. They are usually produced from natural gas. Mm -hmm. In our case, we are using plastics. This is a high performance uh, additive for manufacturing of uh, different plastics for engineering purposes, for manufacturing for batteries of well. batteries as well, correct. And this is of economic value, you can sell it. Yes, this uh, has very high economic value. Mm. Uh, this black powder, one kilogram costs $30, $50. Having proven the technology in the lab, Andre and his partner, Professor Gregor Lisak, 
now plan to focus on proving its effectiveness on a high load of plastic. With that in mind, the duo have co-founded a startup called Nanomatics. Have you ever thought of what happens with the plastic when you throw it to the trash bin? And this project actually started with this question. Andrew was just showing me we have a little plate of that much plastic. We need to let it eat more. Yes, that, that's true. We have to take this invention out of the lab. We have to upscale it. We have to test it in real environmental conditions. And this is exactly what we are trying now to achieve. So what's the next level? In our activities, we are looking at scaling up this technology to be able to chin one ton of plastic a day. One ton of plastic would actually allow us to get around 200 kilograms of carbon nanotubes and 30 kilograms of hydrogen. Well, we're also thinking about deploying mobile units to where the problems are. Yeah, that's the whole idea about our technology, that actually it can be mobile. It is compact enough to be simply packed in a container and shipped whenever there is a problem of plastic pollution. So we don't foresee any problems uh, on the operational side. Professor Lisak estimates it could take up to five years before the solution can be applied on a big scale in the real world. And while it can put plastic waste to good use, it doesn't change the impact of the pollution on those who feel it the most. People like Uncle Go, a fish farmer who has been living on this Keelong, a traditional offshore fish farm, for 27 years. Uncle Go and Matilda told us that the plastic issue is too pronged. First, it can suffocate the fish by clogging their gills or causing gastrointestinal issues. And the second, harmful bacteria that grows on these plastic surfaces can often lead to algae blooms. When there's a heavy rain, synthetic chemical fertilizers and pesticides that are used in palm oil plantations or many other kinds of plantations wash into river systems and they wash into the sea. They start to build up within the top layer of water the water itself polluted with these chemicals, they might also encourage the growth of algae. Matilda told Farmers like Uncle Go lost a total of 600 tons of fish in 2015 alone. The impact on these local farms matter because 10% of Singapore's seafood comes from them. Matilda believes a low-cost solution can be found in nature's water purifiers, seaweed and mussels. As filter feeders, mussels filter their food out of water, feeding on algae, bacteria, phytoplankton and other small particles. And the World Bank estimates that 500 tons of seaweed can potentially absorb 30% of the world's nitrogen and a third of its phosphorus. Right now, she's collaborating with Uncle Go to test this idea. There are about 220 seaweed and mussel lines surrounding the kelo. When there's chemicals in the water or, let's say, ammonia, phosphate, nitrite, nitrates, these curtains are absorbing all of that and preventing it from ending up in the fish that he's rearing in the middle of these farms. For the past six months, we've been measuring water quality. These natural solutions, they are having a minimal yet positive effect. So with the data that we've been collecting, we've realized that it does have a, a dramatic reduction in ammonia, slightly reducing the amount of phosphate and nitrate in the area. 
to get like a machine that would be able to do that, you're gonna spend at least about ten million dollars, right? Doing what simple seaweeds and mussel do on a twenty-four hour basis without even like a plug of energy in there or electricity. It's a sad view to see all these plastics lying on our beaches and floating on our oceans, but that's not the entire picture. In this seemingly clean jar of ocean water, there could be thousands of microplastics inside. These are the plastic that's smaller than five millimeters. But how harmful are these microplastics? To answer this question, we got in touch with world-class competitive sailor turned marine microbiologist Federico Lauro. So you, ocean is obviously close to your heart. You're very close to it. Have you seen the condition of our ocean change over the years? Yeah. Anecdotally, for sure, and the most uh, incredible places I've been sailing uh, around the world, like for example, the Chagos Archipelago, there's no people living there, and yet the beaches are littered with plastic litter. What we can see, what we can see is what we're trying to discover, right? The first thing is we really don't know how much microplastics is in this water. The second is it probably forms uh, the big bulk of plastics in the water itself. You don't see it, so you don't care about it. We're talking about what happened at the very small level. There's normal microparticles in the ocean. For example, big uh, zooplankton that actually gets colonized when they die and sinks. But here, suddenly you have a new type of particles and we yet don't know how this colonization affects uh, the export of, of carbon and material to the deep ocean. Do we know what kind of damage it has already done? Anecdotally, yeah, the damage and the impact to the environment is huge. Practically, we'll only be able to appreciate it as more research is being done in probably 10 years down the line when we start to see the, the changes. Federico and his team are currently conducting a study and a joint initiative between Singapore and the UK. The multinational study is looking at the journey of microplastics through the waters of Southeast Asia, the sources and the sinks. It will also look into the pathogens and microbes found on these plastics and their impact on marine animals. But the most important objective is to find out how these microplastics are degrading in the environment and whether naturally occurring microbes play a role in that process. So in different locations, the concentration yes. is different? Yeah, absolutely. So they vary drastically or...? Well, it, rest, it varies seasonally, it varies, uh, and that's why we're doing these, these regional sampling, is to try to build a model of how the plastic is moving around here. Okay, so we're gonna be collecting the surface water with a device that we just floating deployed, device, the floating right? device. Yeah. And the water is gonna come in and go through these three filters. So okay. these three filters are different sizes. That one is 300 micron, this is 100 micron, yeah. micrometers, and this is 20 micron. Mm -hmm. Anything that is in that size range. So the microplastics gets collected onto here, but also any biological particles that are in that size range. Then in the lab, we separate the biological from the non-biological, basically right. the, the okay. microplastic. You can see the size here. This is 500 microns, so this is uh, basically half a millimeter mm -hmm. in, in size. You can still see particles that are clearly microplastics. There's a lot of concern from consumers. All these fish we're eating has so much microplastics uh -huh. inside. I think the natural question is, is it harmful? I can't stress enough that plastic is just one of the many pollutants we're eating on a daily basis when we eat fish. We're eating a lot of it, there's no doubt, but we're also eating endocrine disruptors, we're also eating heavy metals, we're also eating a lot of other stuff that is potentially more harmful to us than, than plastic itself. There's a very big interest in microplastics. It's a super hot topic. 
and there's a lot of research getting done in temperate region, very little research uh, being done in, in tropical and equatorial regions. So in reality, Singapore is probably the, the first one to invest heavily in trying to understand the problem and the solution. Now you've seen how plastic pollution is plaguing our oceans, and we've shown you some solutions that our scientists are working on to try to solve or rather mitigate these problems. But there's just so much plastic out there. Is there a way to replace these plastics with biodegradable and more sustainable materials? Professor William Chen and his team are working on just that and tackling food waste issue in the process. Uh, Go to this our food system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please come in. Thank please you. Come in. There we go. So this is so, one of the projects you're yes, working yes, on. Yes, yes, So mm -hmm. basically, we are talking about how to remove nutrients from the crown shell and then develop into calcium based clean film. Yeah. Mm. So we start with this crown shell crushed into powder. Yeah. yeah. After that, we start the, the fermentation process. Basically, the fermentation would remove all the proteins, the lipid, the minerals on the powder. And then we end up with this chitin powder. We would convert it into chitosan, and then uh, here's a film. Yeah. And this, what kind of usage for the... Ideally, this would be the replacement for clean film. While you're still in the R&D process of perfecting this technology, but you already have an existing partnership with the uh, oh, yeah. industry, yeah. So what are they doing now? Current plastic manufacturer, they use some kind of resin. We are working together to convert this powder into resin so that uh, they can feed into the machine to the easily. Existing yes, machine. The, the whole idea is that we do not want to reinvent the wheel right. to create another production line. That That is very costly in yeah. the range of 10 to 15 million. Besides prawn shells, Professor Chen has also made plastic from soybean product waste. When soybeans are crushed for their juice, the leftover pulp is usually discarded. But not in this lab. Here, the unwanted pulp goes through a fermentation process to create cellulose, which is then used to make biodegradable plastic. Definitely can see the similarity. Texture, it's very similar. The, th yeah. the thickness, yeah, yeah, yeah. the hardness. That's right. Both, are, both seems hard to break. Chitosan and cellulose mm. are the most abundant biopolymer in nature. Mm. So actually, we're going back to nature to, to have a natural solution. Our plastic products are not toxic. They're biodegradable. Mm. When they are in contact with microbes, like for example in soil, or when we dispose this as a general waste, mm -hmm. There are a lot of microbes around, then they will disappear within three weeks. They will not generate any um, microplastic or, or other toxic component. If you put these two products on the table, mm. wrapping the food product, mm. they will not they will not degrade. Otherwise, uh, it defeats the purpose. <laughs> How much is it going to cost to create the same size bag in a biodegradable? Okay, so field? yeah, so at the lab scale, comparable. But we're hoping that when it's a scale up, the cost will come down at the comparable level. Otherwise, consumer, they only look at the price point. If it's too costly, they would still choose a petrochemical plastic. It's easy to feel desperate and sometimes hopeless when you look at the amount of plastics in our oceans and on our beaches and thinking what I, a single person, could do. Well, for a start, we could buy less single-use plastics and when we have to, reuse them. We can bring our own water bottles and grocery bags. We can recycle our waste. We can also go for beach cleanups. Although it's true that all these actions seem inadequate compared to the amount of plastic that's already out there and the amount of plastics that we are still consuming every single day, we mustn't give up. I think it was the late Queen Elizabeth once said, if enough grains of sand is dropped at one side of a pair of scales, eventually it will tip against a lump of lead. For Simon Asia, I'm Mirulu in Singapore. Share your
your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.